I, first I'd like to introduce you guys because um, we're recording this as a podcast. You guys are going to use it from some of your additional stuff, YouTube and the different platforms that you guys are using. Um, for our followers that don't know you, and a lot of them do because I think a lot of them cross over. Uh, I think we've been we've been on a couple different podcasts together, or not together, but the same podcast. So I do think there is a familiarity there. Um, but first, we, you know, I met you guys a long time ago in Minnesota. Yeah, it was a really long time ago. Uh, at the best outdoor show ever, if you recall. Yeah, in St. Cloud. Oh my gosh, Cloud. yeah. Remember that thing that was a desert? Yeah. It was. Oh. It was, uh, we, I mean, we pretty much sat there and hung out the whole weekend. Maybe there was like one or two busy. At best. And I met like 20 people rolled through. Yeah, and I think busy is a relative term there because I think busy was like a person came by. So, um, but you know what? There's always positives, I think, that come out of stuff. Um, to me, that was sure. that, the opportunity was to be able to get to know you guys. Um, since then, we've, I think you guys helped me build one of my first websites. I think it was, you know, remember how long ago that was? That was a long time ago. I was at my parents' house doing business out of their basement at the time. So um, it was a while ago. It was uh, a different, different, different time. But um, so we've known each other a while. Um, I'd like to have you guys kind of share your story a little bit. When I met you, it was Minnesota. Now you guys are relocated. I'll let you kind of talk about where you guys are. Um, but if you could share kind of a little bit of background about who you are and wh where you got, how you got to kind of where you are right now. Absolutely. So um, that is a, a longer story probably than uh, we've got time for today. Maybe but... time for today. But there are a few things that happen. So when we were up in Minnesota, uh, I worked for another kennel. It's actually Willow Creek Kennels. I worked there for a few years. And Kat actually started working there as well. We got to spend... Mm, about three and a half, four years, three and a half years there. Yeah, about three and a half years. Learning how to train dogs, working with dogs, doing all that aspect of stuff. And in that time period, we did some guiding. We did some other cool stuff with that. Did and some video work. Did some video work, yeah. A little bit of met you at shows. Yep. Um, we did a couple other shows with... DC Systems. DC Systems. And after that... We actually got the opportunity to move down closer to my family, and and not so dang cold. Not so dang cold. Minnesota's pretty darn cold. We're weak. Where where are you guys? Where are you guys from originally? Um. So Kat originally is from North Dakota. Okay. Yeah, it's I've cold there too. Done the cold stuff. I'm over it. Yeah. And I uh, have moved around a lot, so I would say that I'm from the Midwest, Upper Midwest. Okay. Living from North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, Missouri, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Iowa, Jeez. Texas. We lived for a while. I didn't. We're in Kansas and we're here to stay. Okay. Well, I like that. I like that. We had the opportunity to move down close to my family, which actually was in the northwest part of the state, and then that's where we actually started our business. Uh, and then would be what now? Four years in July. Two? Um, four years in July. Four years in July. We'll be in the time flies. where we're at now, which is right outside of Hutchinson, kind of between Hutchinson and Wichita, south central Kansas. Okay. And that's where your kennel is now? Yeah. That's where we're right now, yeah. Okay. Now, share with us a little bit about your, your kennel. Uh, I always tell people that you're my GSP people. Like I, I get a lot of messages and I get a lot of people that um, are, we, we actually get a lot of, we get a good number of pointing dogs to come up to our workshops and a lot of heavy GSPs, I would say. Um, you are who I always steer people to when they're reaching out to find out where, where should I start looking, um, who, you know, even some of the questions I've sent some questions to you that I just said I I I don't know here's what I would do but I think you know here's a guy that specializes or, or a, a pair of people that specialize in it so uh, share with me a little bit specifically about Standing Stone. Well, we definitely appreciate you sending people our way. Uh, we are training 
not just German short hairs. We breed German short hair pointers, so um, that's where we specialize in short hairs. But we also train all breeds. Um, we do a lot with the versatile hunting dogs, so pointing breeds specifically. Um, we train in the lab here and there, um, but primarily we do versatile hunting dogs, and we put a lot of emphasis on obedience training because I would say 99.9% .9 of the people that send their dogs to us are family hunting companions sure. first um, that live in the house with them are part of the family, and then they get out to hunt a few times a year, so they want their dog to be able to do that as well. Right. I'm getting, I wanted to cut in here real quick. I'm getting a bunch of comments coming through, A, that people can't hear us, and B, that we're getting echoey again. So why don't we do this? Why don't we throw um, and end our, we're going to end our Facebook Live. We'll stay on yours for now. Everybody that's Instagram, excuse me, Instagram Live, Facebook Live, still rolling. And we'll look at those questions here in a second. Sure. Uh, what um, we'll do is we'll end ours. We'll stay on your deal for now, and then, like, I'll just make a post and people yeah. can bop over if they want to and we'll tell everybody where we're at. Works for me. So he's going to hang that one. Yep. Okay. So you're going to end that one. Yep. I'm going to end it right now. That should make all of this sound better, folks. Let us know if you're happy, listeners and followers. Okay. I suppose they won't be able to tell if we don't talk. Yeah, they're gone. Hey, the echo, it's the spirit too. It does sound good here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now we'll uh now we'll really get down to it. So did you have anything else you wanted to add on your kennel? Um, I was gonna say we uh, also try and do the same in return. Anybody that's looking for shed dog work, the number one thing that I say is man, this is the only product out there that's worth working with. I appreciate that. It's uh it's where I would start anyhow. Perfect. Well, I appreciate that. How? Quick question for you, and it's maybe more. I'm looking for. Uh, I'm curious myself. So, how, how many dogs do you guys have at a time there for in for training? We stay about 20 dogs in for training. And how many litters do you do Sometimes a year? A few more than that. Um, typically not less than that, but right in that 20 dog, um, 25 dog range. And then we also have a personal dog. Sure. That we don't add to that number. How many litters a year do you typically have? We typically do about five litters a year. It depends on females and heat cycles and if we're running hunt tests and things like that, as well as, you know, we're always monitoring the health of the females sure. uh, to decide if we're going to breed them again or give them a, you know, litter off. Right. So. And you hunt all of your dogs, correct? We definitely do, yeah. yeah. We hunt them all. Now, One of the I things... Say, um, you're you're gonna gonna have... Whatever's going on right now, I can't hear you at all, buddy. I turned my volume up all the way through this. Um, let me try. That's it. Whatever, Whatever that was. was. Oh, I put my mic must be on the bottom. You got something I could set this up on top. Is it better now? Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, now we worked the kinks out. We're only into it. Hey. Perfect. Okay. How come no one says they can hear me? I don't know. Okay, good. Maybe they, okay. Maybe just so here we go. Uh, so hunting the dog. So the reason I <laughs> the reason I ask it is because I just think it's uh, you know I, over the years I've I've had the experience to uh, had the opportunity to meet a lot of people, a lot of breeders, a lot of kennels trainers, and I just I've always it's I I, I really look at the amount of hunting that the dogs do especially in the breeding and so so I, I think it's it, and there's a reason why I send people your direction is because that is I kind of knew that answer but I wanted to ask it because I think it's a really important aspect that you're proofing your lines you're proofing your genetics in the field in the fall um, it I think what it does is it forces you to be relatively um, minimal when it comes to actual litters like you can't have a million litters because you just don't have the ability to work those dogs all those dogs in the field so it's a credit and a testament of what you guys are doing i think that's part of the the recipe in my opinion as well it's a it's a really great evaluation process for us i mean you run a dog you take a young dog hunting and 
you find out if they've got what it takes. And if they don't, unfortunately, that's when we might have to make a hard decision about moving them out of our breeding program because we know they're just not quite what we're looking for sure. to continue producing puppies for our breeding program. And um, the only way you find out if that's going to be the case is if you take them hunting. Great. Right. And I love when you say hunting because I, you know, and Ethan and I have had some conversations about competition stuff, trial stuff, working dogs. And I don't have anything, I have nothing against them. I just think there is a difference from the hunt. Most people, I think, buy dogs. The people that I talk with, most people buy dogs looking to take them to the field for hunting. Um, now, if you're looking to do trials and stuff, that's a different, can, can be a different animal. Not that it has to be, not that you can't do both, but I do think it's important that you hunt your dogs. That's the, the key. Yeah, 100%. And the other side of that, too, is, you know, I mean, the the dogs that actually go hunting, because we are very, very, very fortunate that we get the opportunity to go hunting, um, change so much. You know, I mean, a dog that, there's been dogs, too, that we've worked with that, I don't know, I mean, we're going through training, and it's like, yeah, they do a nice job, but then when they get that opportunity to really show what they have as a whole, you know, to fill that, it, it completely changes what they are. Right. And it shows you a whole different animal, so. Perfect. Okay, now that we got that intro out of the way, I've got a real good question. I've got the, probably the most difficult question here, or most important perhaps. Uh, cocktail of choice tonight. It is cocktail. Now, hey, did you know it's 420 today? Yes. yes. And we're competing with Willie Nelson. Yeah. yeah. I had to explain to Kat today what for, I was like, it's 420, and she's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, mean, nice. I said, uh, you and me both, Kat. I had to get explained too. Ben explained it to me. <laughs> We're on the Come same on. page then, because I had no idea. I'm telling you, it's a judgment free zone around here, but. Uh, we're competing. I was listening. Willie Nelson has a four-hour and twenty-minute party going on. A little tempting, I think, but uh, we'll get through it. We're limited to an hour anyway because I think our live will go off then. So, but anyway, so cocktail of choice. What are you drinking tonight? I am uh, call me old-fashioned, but I, I saw you do this. I love it. Old-fashioned in it. Yes. Very good. Wisconsin old-fashioned, or is it a Kansas one? This is a this is a Kansas old fashioned because I made it in Kansas. Okay, okay, <laughs> we're gonna get into that. Cat, what are you having? Okay, I'm drinking a mule. I don't really care for old fashions. I've tried. I sure. Just, they sound delicious. They've got all the right things, and then I taste them, and I'm just like, mm, no. Hmm. It's interesting. It's interesting. Well, I love a Moscow mule myself. Uh, Ethan, brandy or whiskey? I, I have whiskey in here. Now, okay. I am a rye fan, and I would say that well, we've been in a couple different bourbons here this evening. Um, but right now, I've got Jefferson's um, Aged at Sea, the ocean in here. Which well, is, yeah. Kentucky, I think. Yeah, yeah. We, we went, Ben, that's where we went. We went to a, sh a trade show and we took him to a little bar and we had a, a, K a Kentucky bourbon bar and we had that. It was excellent. It, we, it rocks in the ocean or something. And, yep. Yeah. Yep. So they say. Yeah. Well, we're pretty fancy up here. We're doing Windsor, Canadian. Uh, we are whiskey in the week and we're brandy on the weekends. So um, it, we've got our own little twist. I like to add, instead of a simple sugar we or a simple syrup, we are adding maple syrup and it's homemade maple syrup so uh interesting you add, cut those trees yourself oh boy let me tell you a little something podcast episode number 60 i believe uh i did a whole podcast on it it was a process and i'd never done it before this is the first year i ever did it i'll never not do it again i absolutely loved it um but it was the first year, first year we ever made it ourselves uh, it was awesome it was fantastic I got the opportunity to, oh, this last summer. Well, I was, um, at a, I was judging in Michigan. Yeah, so uh, Kat's judging uh, on a NABDA event, and the, it happens to be on a property where they have commercial um, tree tapping and maple yeah. syrup producing. So he got to go, like, and tour the whole Yeah, day. the guy's like, hey, why don't you come with me? I, I love like, it. Okay. Fascinating, isn't it? What, what, yeah, I would love to learn about this, but I didn't realize how much was going on. I mean, they had tubes strung between about, I think he told me, like 4,000 trees or 6,000 yeah. trees or something. It's crazy. And they, they use a commercial, like, reverse osmosis system to do all of the 
was it was pretty, very impressive. And he's like, here, have some maple syrup. And that was some dang good. It was it's fine, isn't it? Syrup yeah. Syrup. 100%. I love it. I love it. I used to, I grew up poor. We were log cabin in Aunt Jemima, but once we went real maple syrup, no, 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 I'll never go back. Yeah. Nah, I agree. So. Cool. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you're old-fashioned. We are too. Uh, ben and I are both in into that tonight as well. Uh, let's let's. Did you see any questions come up that are right now? Because I've got I've got a couple. Um, boy, Forsberg thinks Ben looks stoic. Yeah. Which, as usual, he says. That's not far off. Um, I've got I got a couple questions on Instagram after we did our story or, or our little live here this afternoon. Yeah. They're good questions. We can start with that, or we could dig right in. We've got, one, if we've got a good live one. I'd rather do a live one because these people are for sure watching. Yep. So, so um, Jacob C V Mahoney says, "Have you guys ever had experience with an English Springer Spaniel doing any tracking? You guys do much training for you do some training down there for tracking, don't you?" Um, you're talking tracking like blood tracking. Kind I'm assuming right? I'm assuming he's talking That's game recovery. Good. Yeah, big game. And I've seen you. We've talked a little bit about it. You do a bit of it, don't you? We have talked, and that I mean, you you probably have been involved in the extent of my experience in this topic. I've uh, trained two dogs. Sure. So. One of them's yours, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'll I'll field it. It's a quick answer. Have you ever guys experience with English Springer Spaniels? I haven't personally, um, but I have a buddy that's got a, cock, a little English Cocker. I've worked with some really good Springers. Do you guys have many Spaniels in by you for training? For upland stuff? We get some English cockers in. So we get a few cockers, yep. So I really like the Spaniels. Um, for me, I, li I think they're a lot of fun. I personally, they're a little fast for me most of the time. Um, I love their size. I like a little bit smaller dog like that. So I haven't, so Jacob asked, I haven't personally trained any English Springer Spaniels on tracking. Do I think they would do well at it? Absolutely. Um, again, I don't think that... A lot of this stuff I don't think is breed specific. I think it you have inherent traits that make the job a lot easier, and the noses are very hard to beat on, on the Spaniels. And I also think I've got this new respect for the English Cockers. Um, i got a really good buddy that, that breeds really good ones. And the amount of control and handle that they can put on one of those little dogs, um, it blows my mind. So I, I think they would make a really nice little tracking dog. Um, I think they're real driven by retrieve from my experience, so I, I would definitely tie in retrieve as a reward when it comes to the training process. I would try to connect it to a retrieve from a training standpoint. So that would be my take on that. So he did say wounded game. And he also asked about sheds. Sheds, same thing. Yeah. No, no exact same thing. So do you have any other good ones on there? Um, a lot of people sending in what they're drinking. There's choices. a lot of drinks going on out there, which I like. I think we saw a good one scrolling. Um, this yeah, would be an interesting one. Go for it. Yeah, this, is a, this is a big one. I thought we were trying to warm up a little bit, but... Um, well, I'm into my second, so... <laughs> <laughs> it says, uh, Glass... Bam, Bamman. Glass, glass Bam, Bam, Bam. Bam. Yep, it says... I watched both of your videos religiously. Oh, I read this one. Dog Bone does not, yeah, thank you for the support, by the way. We love you. Um, Dog Bone does not use e collars. Standing Stone does. I would love to hear a debate on that topic. Boy, you saw that? We saw that one coming, didn't we? <laughs> well, first of all, you're wrong. No, I'm just Yeah, kidding. right? <laughs> I, I think you're right. That is a big one. Uh, and I'm not going to pussyfoot around it. I'm not going to skirt around it. I think it's a huge topic, and I think it could be um, discussed as a podcast in its own. So I don't want to necessarily just tie it down to that. But um, do I, I think personally that most of the people using them, you know, do they need them? I, I don't know. I would make an argument that they probably don't. But... It's what works best for you. It's what works best for your dog. I'm not going to tell people. One of the things I think I get that's a mistake oftentimes, and, I'm, and maybe I lead people down that road, is 
I don't want to be a person who tells you what you shouldn't do. I want to be able to show someone what they can do or give them something that they could have as an option for training that may be something that they didn't realize could happen. And when it comes to the collar conversation, I think so many people think you can't train dogs without them. The, the struggle I have is the questions that come to me. I got two or three of them this week, in the last week, that say, I'm having this issue, should I go to the collar? And I go, oh, that's the problem with the collar. And, and I, I just recently listened to a podcast and a guy that's a collar rep, uh, works for a collar company. It's what really gets under my skin is he referred to it as the magic wand. And I went, that's the problem. Yeah, it's it's not. not a magic wand. It's Thank not. you. So that's the biggest issue I have with it. Um, you know, me personally, again, I don't want to go any go a whole lot deeper into the, into this one because I I'd love to just not tonight, but it's a it's to me it's a those are the those are the primary things that hang hang me up. I'm a, I'm a big believer in trust and feel and and I don't think you guys aren't like I think we have that in that's that's what I think we have a lot in common with. Um, to me, it's well, it's. I think that we should. We should throw this up here right now that we're going to plan on doing this. It'll Let's be an just hour plan special. The, sure. the debate. Yeah, that would be a good one. Debate. That would be uh, a good one. Necessary, yada yada yada. But um, I want to say that I agree with you. We actually just talked about this in a in our last gala that'll be out. Yes, our you ask we answer podcast that we throw out there. We talked about this specifically and used those exact words that it is not a magic device. It yeah. is not a magic tool that makes things happen. So yeah. sure. it's, um, it's kind of crazy that that, that So that's... So definitely, I can say I agree with you the fact that um, my, my debate aspect of it would be that I believe that it's more beneficial with different types of dogs. Different breeds of dogs, different personalities of dogs. Sure. It can be more beneficial as a trend. Sure. Good. Now, um, I like that. Kind of leads into this next question. Ben, where's the one that Ben's on barmaid duty right now, which I'm not going to argue with that. But uh, there was, he's a fine one too at that. Uh, where was that question that said um, the different? Oh, it's one of those. It's one of those Instagram questions. All right. Um, I'm going to grab. I'm going to grab this question quick for you. Uh, and I'm going to kind of read it to you guys. I'd like you guys to kind of handle it first because I think it's a great question. And let me just read this to you. Uh, no, I want, what's the difference? So this guy says, I've been listening to your podcast and following your Instagram page. Uh, it's very interesting. I listened to it real informative. If I remember right, you said you were going to get a pointer in the near future. I have a German wire-haired pointer that unfortunately was hit by a car and killed at two years old. I really like your foundational training philosophies. Once work slows down a little, I'm going to get another GWP and was curious how you would train a pointer compared to a flushing breed. I'm interested in looking at different training styles. I found some bits and pieces from a few that I like that I think will work best for me. I think we will work. Um, I'm reaching out to see if you had any input, some key things to focus on and try. The dog will be primarily used as an upland dog for pheasants here in central Iowa. I also want a duck hunt, shed hunt, and blood trail with this dog. So primarily pheasant dog, but it's going to do a little of everything. True the, versatility right there. Yeah, and I think, got a nice, nice, pick a nice breed, I think, to do it. The question I think is the big takeaway from that one is uh, when it comes to how would you train a pointer compared to a flushing breed? And part of my, part of the reason I like this question is Ethan and I have had some conversations about it because I've been in the market uh, for a pointer myself and I've talked about it for about a year and a half, maybe two years now. And I'm probably putting a deposit down. I got to make a visit yet to the kennel, but I'm probably putting a deposit down in the next month. And I'm going to, I've got my thoughts on it, but I want to hear yours first on the, how you're going to approach training that pointer versus the breed, the flusher. So we primarily train and work with pointers. So as far as a training the pointer versus the flusher, um, it's going to be more natural just to say, these are the things that we would do uh, with our 
pointing or versatile birds specifically. I will say uh, you need to have a realistic conversation with yourself. Or I didn't catch the name of the question. Dylan. 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 So Dylan, you need to you need to ask yourself the question of what is my primary focus? Is that going to be bird hunting? Is that going to be tracking? Is that going to be shed hunting? Is it going to be waterfowl hunting? What is the primary focus? He said, Especially with a young dog, you don't want to necessarily jump into everything at once because you're going to just throw a lot of confusion at them. Uh, they need time to become confident in each of those tasks before you're moving on to the next thing. Um, and it's going to take, I wouldn't even just say a season, it's going to take years to develop a dog that's going to be proficient at all those things. We have a saying, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. Um, dogs can perform well with, you know, that many different things, wearing different hats, if you will. But it takes time. it's going to take time for them to master each of those things. It's not going to be like, oh, I work on all this training in the off season and they're ready for hunting season and they're going to do it all. And they're going to do it all phenomenally. That's a very unrealistic expectation. Totally. So deciding agree. what your primary focus would be um, and starting there um, and then working into the other avenues of your goals would be my recommendation. I agree. And I think... <laughs> So my, my thought with it, and the, and the one thing he said was he, he said is primarily he's going to be a pheasant dog for him, but he wants to do duck hunting, shed hunting, blood trailing with the dog. And I, I can't agree more with the idea of it's going to take multiple seasons. I personally think, and I'm probably terribly slow with everything I do, but I think it takes, like to do one, I think it's going to take, me personally, I think it's going to take multiple seasons with the dog for them to be where I think I want them to be. And maybe, maybe they, ne I, I, I hate to say it, but I don't, I don't use the term finished. Like I never use, I'm never, I don't have any finished dogs. I don't train finished dogs. Um, I get a lot of messages. I think it's a term that's used in the industry. I don't hesitate to tell people, I just, yeah, it's all, it's all relative. Right, and so I just don't, I don't know that they're ever finished. Thank you, Ben. Mm -hmm. And I think, Ben, he's got an empty glass too. Well, he's got, or you got an orange in yours? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good work. I didn't garnish this one. Um, I also, so what I, but what I'm curious is, like, I, I tell people for us, I spend probably 10 to 12 months. I think it's 80%, maybe more, focused. It's real heavily, primarily focused on foundation building. Like, that's just how I do it. Now, I don't, I don't have a timeline because I just don't, it's not a, it's not a send the dog for month to month or anything. People are so hung up with what age do I start doing this with my dog? When can I do this? When can I do this? And I mean, I get it, right? I understand you want, you want to be plan. able to have a plan. You want to be able to say, I'm following these steps, my dog's on track, my dog, whatever, but all dogs are individuals. And that's, that's the problem that we run into is that everybody wants exactly what you just mentioned. They say, what should my dog be doing by this specific age? Right. You know and it I mean? depends on the dog and it depends on truly what you can put into the dog because everybody has different priorities in their lives too you know they don't have as much free time to train as they'd like the dog just gets worked on the weekends well that's going to take you a lot longer to get there than if you have more availability to work on those tasks sure. even if you have all, all the time even if you have all the time every dog develops different yeah. true and you can overtrain for sure totally i i have all the time i think when it comes to a dog and i still am the guy who raises my hand to say it takes me forever and i and i I think it takes a little while. Like I'm, I, I'm going to share that. I, I got another podcast in my mind to do. Um, it's about a project that I have going on right now, and I'm, I'm embarrassed. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say. I have people ask about this project I'm doing. I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't share anything about it, and because I was hung up on the idea of, it's taking me so long to do it. I was, I'm just documenting it, taking pictures, taking videos as I go, and then I'm just going to share it all at once. 
And I started, and I mean, I'm a long ways from being done with it. And I've had too many people ask now about it. And I go, why am I afraid to share the idea that it's just taking me a long time to do it? I really shouldn't be bothered by that. I'm the same guy who tells people when they send me stuff about their dog, don't worry about the time, don't worry about what other people say, you know, don't compare yourself to anyone else that you see on Instagram. And so I have to take my own advice at a lot of times. Uh, I feel like I've, it, it spills over into so many other things that we're doing in our lives. So I'm a, I'm just, I have a luxury. I'm really glad that I don't have people that send dogs to me. Now you guys take dogs in primarily, is it broken down by time? From a, from a, like a, if I send it to you, is it based on a month, a, a month to month type training or how do you guys do it? We're losing them here. Uh oh. I'm a, you broke up just a little bit there? Yeah, I got you back now, I think. Uh, I think you're back now. I you see. You said something about time. What is our thoughts? I didn't catch it. Yeah, do you guys, how, you guys are set up, do people send dogs to you for like, now you're really good. You're coming in really good now. But do do people send their times like three month block, six month block? How do you typically do it? Um, yeah, we say the average dog, depending on their goals, we can work with goals for most dogs. Then if we're looking at more advanced things and more formal work, it's going to be longer than that. And we just go over what our typical timeline is with every dog. Um, and then we just let everyone know that everybody's dog's different and that's right. a very big range. Totally. I would say that... Um, you know, the average dog that we end up working with is looking for green work. They want obedience and they want a basic understanding of hunting work. Yeah. They want to be ready to go hunting and then they just need that experience of be hunting season. Right. Of a hunting season. But they need the basics to be there. Oops, sorry. Let me bump you a little bit more, honey. Oh, easy, you two. <laughs> you gotta get so close because of the. Up ben, and don't downs. get any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm going to have to take a pause here and refill and we're about there. That's okay. I can field all the questions. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, we're good on time, right? I'm going to have Ben watch our time too because we're at an hour we're going to lose. We're going to end. We're going to run out of Instagram time. So, right. um, so okay. Well, I, 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 like, I like the idea of making a point to stress for people that are following this or listening to this. You got to throw time out. You just, it, you can't, especially because people are watching this and they're training their dogs at home. And that's the key. Like one of the things that we talked about when we wanted to do this was we got really weird times right now. Like just strange things are happening. And what can we, I, this is not to try to throw this into a different direction, but I think this world right now, we need to do as much as we can to be positive about stuff, as much as we can to help as many people as we can, because right now there's a hell of a lot of stuff that sucks and we just, it's, it's up to us to figure out what do you make, how do you make something positive out of it? And I, I see a lot of opportunity. And so when we teamed up or decided to team up to do this, the whole idea was there's a bunch of people at home right now training and we're, we're going to, we're not looking to sell them to send dogs away for training. We're trying to say, what can you do at home to make your training more successful, get more out of your relationship with the dog, build a better connection trust, feel, all the things that I think are really important. And so time can't be a part of that equation, I don't think. Right. And we are in completely uncharted waters for most people on what's going on in the world right now and having all of this extra time at home and no other distractions really of going, well, I want to go to the movie theater or right. I want to go out to dinner. Those aren't options right now, so we're finding ways to use our time at home, and if we've got a dog, we're, we're wanting to work with them. Um, I would say that one thing that I've noticed recently is um, people are reaching out to us at least for you know guidance with training questions and things like that, and one thing is people are, I don't want to say they're making the mistake, but eventually, hopefully, we're all going to get back to the real world eventually and people that are working from home are going to be back in the office and they've gotten these new puppies that they're giving all this free time to and not developing 
true realistic expectations of what that puppy's life could potentially be like when, you know, in a month or two, we're hopefully back to the day-to-day grind of got to leave the house and go to work. And you've got a new puppy that's developed these ideas that all I do is play all day in the house and I don't have true expectations of any crate time or alone time or downtime and I'm constantly being stimulated and that could set you up for some, I don't want to say failure, but some struggles in the, in the future. Totally. I call it cultural impacts. Like, it's how you build that dog's daily life to understand what this... Like, one of the things I'm doing right now with a dog named Bella is she's working with other dogs. Like, she's a, she just turned a year. And she, I'm just taking her with other dogs and just having her sit and watch the entire time because she, up until eh, relatively recently, I didn't work her with other dogs because she couldn't focus through it. Like, she, I needed her attention. Now she's matured quite a bit, and now she goes... I want to be in on it all the time. And like you're saying, if the dog is never isolated, I think some people think that putting them in a crate is almost like punishment. And I go, it's a release. It's a way for them to get away from us and de-stress and be safe and, and feel comfortable. And I, I just think you are you nail it when you say, that's eventually what's going to be a heavy, heavy part. And there's nothing wrong with it. I don't think it's bad at all. Uh, but you got to prepare them for it when they're young or you're going to, culturally impact them to understand that it's just a go, go, go world. It's not. Yeah, and then when they don't have that stimulation, that constant attention from mom and dad, they don't know what to do with themselves. And, and they do feel stressed. And that's right. when they do have that anxiety and they freak out and tear themselves up trying to escape a crate or something like that and right. break teeth and things like that. Right. Great point. I got a quick question. I got a question for you that I'm going to ask. I'm going to leave this as a pointing question. I have a lab who has pointing in her blood. How do I go about training that lab to point? I, I've got an answer, but I want to hear yours. Okay. So I actually got to deal with this recently. Um, a gentleman had a pointing lab. We get them on occasion. Now, I will say, here's my little caveat, right? There are some that I have seen that lock up and hold point as long as any short hair that I've ever owned. I mean, they look good. They are fewer and far between because of the fact that there's breeding involved with that and there's hundreds and hundreds of years involved in developing the pointing breeds that are out there and hundreds and hundreds of years of developing flushing dogs. Now, all of that being said, you are breeding dogs that and get a dog out of a, a breeding that's designed or specifically said to be out of pointing lines and whatever, um, I'm going to develop that dog exactly the same as I would any pointing dog. Exactly the same. I'm going to do positive pigeon drills and I'm going to put them on launchers. And My guess is they're going to struggle. Okay. And I've even seen dogs recently. I got a message actually about a dog that was, or a lab that wasn't out of pointing breed. And they actually um, sent me a handful of videos saying, my dog's not at a pointing stock. It's not supposed to be a pointing lab, but she goes out and she points all of her birds solidly. And I'm telling her, whoa, but I've never done any like formal woe training. And then I go in and I flush the birds for her. And I watch the videos because I'm like, yeah, right. I don't think your dog's really that confident with it. And I watched her. Her tail wasn't flagging. Her paw was tucked, which a tucked paw doesn't necessarily mean they're a pointing dog. But she had style. She was intense on her points. And I was like, wow. And I said, well, do you want her to be a pointing dog or do you want her to be a flusher? Because you're at a crossroads at right. this point where you either say you're going to be a pointing dog and I'm going to continue conditioning that instinct in your dog or we need to start encouraging her to flush otherwise she need she's not going to have that confidence to do that and you need to make a decision and he's like no i want her to point this is awesome so sure. we've been talking about how to continue that but um we get the opposite of dogs that are supposed to be pointing bred labs and you cannot get them to point to save your life it seems so the same so I, my thought with it was, this is going to sound terribly simplistic, but pointers point, retrievers retrieve, hounds track, and or tracking dogs track, and hounds fall real heavily into this tracking category. And I had this guy ask me this question real recently about it, and he's got a lot of background with hounds, and I've done some, I ran ran with guys that were big houndsmen, and I, this is a big difference that I see. So. 
there's similarities, but there's also differences. So when I talk about pointing dogs point, I think they either point or they don't point. I don't think you train them to point. I think you may bring, like, I've seen little puppies point butterflies and leaves that flew across the yard when they're little. And I think it, we didn't train them to do that. They did it. It was a very inherent natural thing. I've got retrievers. I don't, I've never trained a retriever to retrieve. They all retrieve. It's a matter of how do I shape and polish and form that to fit my specific needs. Tracking dogs, I've never trained a dog to track. They do it. There's certain things that we enhance and bring out in them that I want them to track and they connect to the idea of there's reward for this. There's some things that they track that we say, no, 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 we don't want you doing that. And they understand, don't follow that. There's negative that may come for it from it. So I'm, I'm just a big believer in that their last name is Pointer. Their last name is Retriever. That's in them. It's a matter of, so like this guy that's got a pointy lab, I totally, I've seen labs that, I, part of this pointing lab thing, I think, and I don't see it necessarily as the craze that it once was, but a lot of it, I think, was heavily driven by marketing. Like, I think it became kind of a cool thing to have. I'm a, I personally, my feelings, and this is not personal, it's just an opinion, but if I want a pointer, I'm getting a pointer. If I want a retriever, I'm getting a retriever. I don't necessarily want a dog to do both. That, that I don't need the dog that I'm going to be doing both with. I want, because I'm a guy that... Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I like the idea of less work for me. And so matching up the right dog that has those inherent traits, to me, is an easier way of going about it. That's just my opinion. And I agree with you completely. Speaking I mean, of people that ask us about, you know, can I teach my, I don't know, Yorkie to be a flushing dog? Maybe not Yorkie, but... Um, People ask about these non-sporting breeds. Can they teach them to be hunting dogs, to be flushers, or to teach them to point or something? And I mean, sure, sure you maybe. can put the time, effort, energy into that dog because there's a development side of things. I have a story about that one. But like you said, Jeremy, why wouldn't you invest in a dog that's been bred for hundreds of years to do the task that you're looking for them to do? Yeah. I agree. I think you can train. I, I think we sell dogs short all the time. I don't think, I think you can do just about anything you want with them. It's a matter of how much work does it take and how much comes natural. 100%. 100%. So I guided for a long time. Uh, still guide, whatever. Guided in uh, Texas, Orvis Place. Uh, it's not wild birds, it's preserve hunt, right? And they put out a lot of birds. I'm talking, I don't know, a two and a half hour hunt. We usually get two and a half hour hunts in the morning, two and a half hour hunts in the evening. And we put out anywhere from 50 to 70 birds, give or take. They kind of mix them up with pheasants, quail, chucker, and Hungarian partridge at this place. This is Greystone Castle. It's a place in sure. Texas. Sure. Um, really, really cool, whatever. So tons and tons of birds. I had a little English cocker. We talked about that a little bit ago. So her name was Georgia. She's a little orange, uh, roan cocker puppy. Tiny. I'm talking, I think she weighed maybe sub 20. I mean, just this little fluff ball. And she'd pick up pheasants. You know, and the, the body of the pheasant's about the same size of the body of Georgia. And... But heart of a lion, which is, yeah, which is a typical about. cocker, heart of a lion, tiny little body. So I used her as a strike dog, what we refer to as a strike dog. So she would heal by me and then run in and flush in front of the point. I usually had two short hairs, which is, I mean, a big thing for us, two short hairs on the ground. I had my one little cocker with me. My little cocker hunted every field, every day, all the time, because she primarily walked by me and then flushed birds up and helped micro trees. Well... When she figured out that when the pointers went on point, that it was her turn to work, she got pretty hard to keep a heel. And it took some handling, like stay here by me until we've got gunners ready to send her in to flush. Now, after, you know, I just talked about like 
50 to 60 birds per day that we're working through. Per hunt. Per Sometimes hunt. you do so, two hunts a day. Yeah, I average probably 30 hunts, so 15 full days of work in a month. But 30 hunts, which get scattered out throughout the month. So we're talking hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of birds because I spent in a short amount of time four or five months down there guiding, doing this. And in that time, conditioning wise, I was able to say to teach her from wanting to go in on those pointers every single time to understanding that when the pointers locked up, she would start looking at me. You know, there was that eye contact, oh, are you going to send me? Are you going to send me? Are you going to send me? And then after that she got even more comfortable to the point where i could let her free hunt a little bit and she would stay close you know within gun range and then when the pointers would lock up she would lock up she would back them. she understood sure. that that she had to wait till she was sent she would stand there and then i could say georgia and she'd take off and go in there and then continuing on that point she started pointing birds she would Really? She's like, stop right here. I'm like, what are you doing? And i like, all right, get ready. Georgia, she run in and flushed the birds out. So she went from an insane flusher with conditioning, 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 conditioning to backing to then actually a pointing cocker. It's, to me, it's, a, it's an exact definition of repetition and consistency forming a habit. Like you could have, you could have allowed the dog to run wild and flush and it'd have been a wild flushing dog the rest of its life. But as you reeled it back in and look at the, look at the reps it got, it got more opportunities. Right. And so in a relatively short period of time, you changed the dog's natural inherent traits through that repetition and consistency. But for someone to say, I've got, said whatever dog and I wanted to be able right. to do this I mean you're talking about thousands, thousands of reps, right. reps. Which so, it's going to go out and do it right so. and most of us don't sh most dogs don't see a thousand birds in a lifetime much less I mean right. a lot of dogs are lucky to see a couple hundred birds in a lifetime honestly 100%. I mean it's yeah. that's reality so and that's why I always think, uh, and that's averages, I take one or two trips a year you know I mean right and that circles that circles back to the idea of the value of a hunting dog. You guys hunt them. Yep. And that's the key. I, th I just think that's such a huge developmental part of it, um, full circle with, with a dog, especially when it comes to the breeding part of it. So this goes hand in hand with um, the dog's experience as well as an individual's experience. And I had a conversation with Tom here. I don't, I don't know if you know Tom. No, what's his last name? With, um, uh, Field and Strain, don't, don't quote me. Field and Strain or Gun Dog or something he helps. He does some writing with and everything else. And I talked to him and he put it in perspective for me. This was, I hadn't even really even thought about this, but he goes, so how many days did you hunt, guide, run dogs this year? You know, I talked about that. And he goes, okay, well, this is the average for an average guy. They spend this amount of time. Let's say they're an older gentleman, 60s, right? They've spent X number of days hunting because they started in their late teens, early 20s, whatever. Um, and then their 20 years or 30 years of experience equates to what you just explained to me that you do in approximately three right. to five. Right. So, you know, it's, he said that, yeah, and this falls right in line with the dogs, the people, this dog that spent one season getting a thousand birds shot over is maybe five to ten times what an, another dog or an average dog might do in an entire life. Do you ever read bartenders at hard at work over here? Bart we need a bartender. Do you anything? No, you do. I'm a sipper. You sipper. do. I have to drive home. So, <laughs> Ben's, Ben's got to go home tonight, so he's not one to one in it with me. So. <laughs> So, back, so do you guys want to pick up right where we were with, with train to retrieve conversation? As, and I'll say, and so I, what I'll say is, the question was, you know, I think the guy was asking, he's on the fence of what to do or how to do it. And again, I think I would go back to this guy and say, I don't know the answer. You know, it's not, I don't know your dog. I don't know you. I think... Personally, so and, and I, I totally, I totally hear what Cat was saying, and I agree with it. The thing that I, the reason I don't, so 
the reason I don't go, and I think you guys almost do a very similar process to what I do. It's just I don't go beyond the conditioning and shaping of hold. And I think one of the things that is really important, and I probably don't stress it enough, and I probably don't hammer it home enough, is for me, I do think that hold conditioning fixes a lot of issues that can come up with the retrieve. I think it can, can, can remedy a lot of bad symptoms. But I don't think people should wait till hold conditioning till they think about their delivery. And I feel like if we spend, I, had, I just saw someone ask a question when we were on Instagram that said, how come you haven't hold conditioned Bella yet? Bella turned one last month. And so I haven't hold conditioned her because she hasn't given me the reason to do it yet. Will I need to do it? Yes. And do I like doing it? No, because it's kind of a boring, a little bit longer process. And so I avoid it probably. I, I wouldn't avoid it if I didn't have to. If, if it, something came up where I was forced to address it, I would have. Bella has been probably the nicest naturalist retrieve I've, I've had. And I've probably spent more time focused early on from day one with her, like literally retrieve number one through today, paying attention, shaping and forming what she did pretty naturally. If she didn't do it naturally, I'd have spent a lot more time repositioning dummies every time it came in, reinforcing the idea of, of probably the biggest thing I think is if we avoid making mistakes early, we don't have to fix them. 100%. Anything your dog's doing consistently to condition themselves to, if they're coming back with that bumper and shaking it and mouthing it and doing all these naughty habits and you just let it go, you're going to have a huge problem to fix later. Whereas if you can do some basic natural retrieving puppy drills from the beginning, from the get-go, to develop the natural retrieve and the natural hold that you're going to want out of your dog, the trained retrieve or that hold conditioning, when you have to do it and when you get to the point where that's the next step in your training, it's going to go so much smoother and so much nicer. Agreed. I would say, you know, and this is not to try and toot our horn because we get to work with a lot of dogs from our program and none of them come in retrieving as well as the, the dog that, that I keep from, from, from the program. So I like, you know, I keep a dog and the most, the most recent example would be Legend. We named a dog Legend, right? He's got big shoes to fill, but he, um, has been very natural, a very natural retriever. We play the games that we show, we play, you know, we encourage that natural mouth and that natural hold, similar to what you're talking about, kind of fixing things and helping along the way to- And not letting him condition shape, naughty habits. Yep, shape a behavior. And when we see things, we have the ability and the, the mind set and the power to know- This isn't uh, we something need to we're fix gonna that want. real quick or we don't want that. Yeah, exactly. And, um, he is now what? Eight months old. We figured this out he just yesterday. Did the math. He's eight months old. Eight months old, and I'm shooting birds over him, and he's retrieving everything. Hey, everything, and without every, mouthing, without munching, he's doing a nice job. Now I've got several of his litter mates in, and none of them are the same. So for me to say that the breeding made that happen, I can't. I can say that the breeding said we've got natural retrievers; they do a good job. And but none of the them are as polished naturally as what he's showing correct. us the, because we condition that. The conditioning and the paying attention to just taking a little extra time with each retrieve and helping, you know, develop and shape a behavior um, has really brought him along just that step above his litter mates. Agreed. And I think that's exactly like another example of, you, Kat, you were talking before about like cultural impacts of a pup. And, and if you are, you know, to me, that's a cultural impact of a retriever oh, during the retrieve. And, and it's, I literally, I've never, I've never put such a focus on a dog prior to this one that we're doing right now with every single retrieve. Like it never, we just lost him. Literally, I've never a dog oh. prior to this one that we're doing right now with every single. I just lost him. I have no idea so. Oh, shoot. He's going to have to rejoin. We just lost Jeremy. I'm rejoining. I guess I you didn't lose me. His internet's not up to par. We'll see if he can uh, tune back in here. I don't know fighting words. 
tweet this will try to pull the question off of you. You can't lose me. Hey, you look much better now. Like, you're not so blurry. Crystal clear, baby. It's because I'm three drinks into her, big fella. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. I I got I got one one. more blurry. No, no, no. Now we make it. looks better. Oh. <laughs> But no, I I think you're right. I think you, I think the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle is if we avoid, if the if we can avoid issues from the start, our life is so much easier. And I just think whole delivery is a really good example of that. That I don't think some people realize. I think they look at, we'll we'll clean it up later. And I'm looking at it and going, don't create it in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. And that can be said for not just retrieving behaviors, but all behaviors that you want totally. your young dog to develop into an adult that you want the right behaviors developed. Yep. So I think, I hope, I, I don't know if that answered that guy's question about hold versus, he said force fetch, call it whatever you want to call it. He just needs to evaluate his dog and see where the holes lie, and if his dog just flat won't retrieve anything and has no drive to run out and pick up whatever it is, he may be looking at a different situation than just hold conditioning. Um, but he just has to be honest and evaluate his own dog and see where the holes lie. So I will say that if the question was, should I just do hold training or should I do the, uh, the full gamut, basically, whatever words you want to use, um, if you're talking about this, you probably have a retrieving issue. Because somebody that dog retrieves I don't know that he's even that far. I, I, the way I read it, I think he's like, he's planning it. He's, you know, I don't think he, so, and, I, and, and to that point, I feel like you're right to, I, I would, this is how I would do it is, I think the beginning of your process is much like my entire process. So I would say you start out in the beginning, you work your way through, and if it's working for you, I'm, I maybe would continue it. If I'm running into issues or it's not working, maybe I do need to go a little bit further, add some more steps or layers to it. Sure, and that comes with um, a lot of times what we call like preventing the cookie cutter, the cookie cutter training method, right? So that, that's the key and the problem, and a lot of people ask us about this. Why haven't you put out, and I'm sure you get the same question because you have a lot of great resources for people trying to train dogs, but why haven't you put out, you know, like a written step-by-step? -step? I don't know if you have. I don't think you have. Nope. I can't. Okay. Yeah. It's so why so haven't you put out a written step-by-step? -step? And the answer to that is because it doesn't fit every dog, right? So right. I don't want you to buy my written step-by-step -step or read my written step-by-step -step and say, well, now I follow these steps and it doesn't fit my dog because the key is there is no cookie cutter method. I mean, it's it's evaluating that dog and you know making adjustments to the program and the protocol to fit them. And we've had people notice this because we have a few complete series on our YouTube channel. It's uh, YouTube Standing Stone Kennels. You can go to playlists and you can watch complete series from eight weeks through almost a year. Basically, ready to hunt for the average guy, ready to hunt, killing birds over them. That's the end of it. And people will notice to say, with this dog, you did collar conditioning to place first, or with this dog, you did this first, or with this dog, the the sequence isn't the same. And my answer to that is because that dog needed that at that time. That's why we did it. And we recommend, you know, find the dog that fits your dog's personality the best and try and follow that timeline. That's going to be closer to what you may need. But there is no one method. Right. I always, I always say it's cooking versus baking is the analogy. In baking, ah, it's, it's yeah. really precise. If you miss an ingredient, you're stuck. You, 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 your thing won't turn out. Cooking, you can... You can take some stuff out. You can add some stuff, different flavors, all that stuff. Right. And you still get some. You get it in the end. To me, that's how dog training is. And I think I'm a big believer, and I think you should listen to it. This is why we reached out to you guys, because I think it's important for people to watch 
listen to, read, as, get as much information as you can, pick and choose what works for you and your dog, and the rest of it, it doesn't hurt to know it. it you might not use it. I learned so much stuff from some of the, some of the research I've been doing in the last couple of years that I never apply. I don't ever apply it, but I understand the general concept better. I understand some of the meaning behind it. 100%, and I want to call this out because I have a very specific example that 100% that drives your point there. Okay, so I've got, I, I don't know exactly the name of the DVD is called, but I believe it's Scott Miller's Training Something. Now, I don't think we'll offend anybody on here because Scott Miller's a pointer guy, a field trial pointer guy, and shouldn't fall into the category of most of this stuff, okay? I watched his training DVD, right? And you can 100% buy them all, watch them all, learn from all of them. You can learn something from everything. Even if that is, I 100% am not ever going to do that. And watching this showed me why I shouldn't do this because I can see how that dog reacted and how sure. the, the, you know, the turnout was and everything else. So Scott Miller's training DVD, I mean, he shows these things and you can see He's got like a this specific example that it, it was like, okay, I can see this, and oh, okay, oh, I can see this, and then it was like, okay. So he takes and puts a half hitch, which for those of you that don't know or that are listening to everything else, it's um, he would clip a check cord to the dog's collar, and you would take that check cord toward their rear end, basically toward their tail, and you would wrap the check cord around on their waist and slip it underneath of itself to make a loop so that if you were to continue to pull the end of the check cord past the dog's rear end, it would make like a, a tightening up spot, if that makes sense. Hopefully I explained that well. Google it. Google it or ask me again later, but the half hitch. So he's got a half hitch style leash on this pointer and he's working on recall. Now he tugs on the leash and he's trying to get a dog to come to it. And the dog feels pressure around his abdomen, which is kind of like a, a stop motion. And at the same time, he's like tugging the dog toward him. From the rear? He's got, the, the dog's trying to face him, but when you pull on that, right, that's it what puts pressure toward the, the rear, rear of the dog. So it kind of like pulls. I haven't watched this DVD. Yeah, right. she hasn't even watched the DVD. I don't know if you should, Cass. <laughs> you should. Okay. You'll learn something not to do. Learn what not so, to do. He pulls this dog's rear end, and you can see this in the video. He tugs on a leash, and the dog's rear end comes toward him, and then he's calling the dog here. And then the dog tries to come around toward him, and he gives it another tug on the leash, and then it kind of pulls the dog back around so it's not facing him again. And you go, this doesn't really look like it's right. working. But obviously, I mean... Being able to watch everything gives you the ability to learn from everything, whether it's good or bad or what you, totally. what you think works. And if you can watch those videos and recognize and go, that doesn't quite make sense, or I can read the fact that that dog isn't responding well to that, it's going to make you a better dog trainer just with your specific dog. I agree. And I think it... I do think too, like, I don't think the more I've watched, the more I've seen, the more I've studied stuff, different people, the way they do things, I've also realized no, not, there's not one guy out there or girl, there's not one trainer out there that is going to revolutionize this world of dog training. We're all like, we're all putting our own little spin or style or, or, or thing that works particularly well, but the general concept is... Real the the broad general concept of raising a dog is is it's in the same direction. It's just a matter of these little finite details that you add to it specifically. And there's you should watch them all because like I watch a bunch of them and I'll pick up maybe one little thing out of a. I just watched a ten hour series and I I didn't get a lot out of it that changed my mind, but I picked up a few things and it's a completely contrasting style of training than what I do. But I did pick up a few things, and I think if you can just pick up, you got to get a jet, you got to get somewhere to start. But then I think it's get as much as you can, and just pick and choose to start adding to you. And, and even the stuff you don't use, I do think it's important to have because there are there's stuff that I never thought I would use, 
and I ran into a dog that you know I needed to use it with for whatever reason down the road. We call it our mega tricks. Like we take all of the knowledge that we gain from watching all of this stuff, listening to things, reading, and put it in this bag. And right. when I get stuck on something, because you're going to get stuck, because not every dog trains the same way. You can't have a cookie cutter process that just well, the dog can't do it this way. Well, now I'm going to pull out of my bag of tricks and go, I'm going to try this with this dog. And it may only work for a handful of dogs, but it works. Um, so we've got our bag of tricks. That's what we call it. I hear you. Hey, there's a question on yours about a retract. I'm kind of interested in your answer on this. About retractable leashes. Did you see that one? It's on your page. Um, have you guys answered anything from your Facebook yet yeah. or just Instagram? We did a few of Facebooks. We did a okay. Few. okay, well, we've got a couple. I want to pull one from Facebook after this, but go ahead and ask. Ask the retractable you got there. I don't see it. So it was, an, it was a question on yours. It just says, do you think a retractable leash is a bad idea for my 18-week-old GSP for an hour-long after-work walk? We tour my parents' 10 acres every day for an hour or so. Okay, so I have an answer for this. Absolutely. I think that retractable leashes and check cords have a place in training in some context. Uh, when we're airing dogs out and they need to go to the bathroom, especially young dogs that aren't maybe as comfortable on a stakeout when you're traveling or they're not collar conditioned because we do a lot of recall conditioning with our dogs um, with the e-collar. And I need to let them potty, but I'm not somewhere that I'm comfortable with them being able to run off. A check cord or those retractable leash leashes are a really good option. If I'm going for an hour long walk through a 10 acre field with my 10, 18, 18 week old puppy. 18 weeks, yep. Yep. I want my 18 week old puppy to be bold and confident, start hunting, start searching, start becoming a little more independent because if it's a pointing breed dog, I definitely want them to learn how to get out, search, and hunt so that they can find me birds. And if they are stuck on a you know, 15 foot retractable leash 15, 20 foot, yeah. or a 15 foot check cord, they're going to do what I like to call the check cord circle, where they're going to run out, they're going to hit the end of that check cord, and they're going to make a circle. And it usually goes behind you, and then it goes back around in front of you, and then they kind of might, you know, work ahead of you a little bit, and then they hit the end of that check cord, and they're at the end of that check cord, and they're going to make this circle around behind you at the end of that check cord and they're only going to ever hunt and feel comfortable getting out that 15 foot and like we talked about before anything a dog's doing consistently they're conditioning themselves to so if you go on multiple walks like that over and over all your dog's going to think is they've got a 15 foot range in this diameter around you and a radius map radius i think around you and um they're not going to learn to extend their search and build a, you know, bold, independent search that I'm going to be able to, yeah, be able to harness into a, you know, true hunting dog that I'm going to want to hunt behind. I agree. I like it. I I hate retractables. Um, I don't use check cords. Um, I do everything I can. I used to make fun of retractables as like the the like show dog stuff or something. Well, I was like. I would never own a retractable. My, you, my, my, my issue with them is the inconsistency and the idea of putting it in the dog's hands to go where, how far out it does. To me, if a dog's on lead, he should be in heel position. If he's not on lead, he's allowed to, he, he, he should be in heel position eventually, but I want him to have the ability to move off. I feel like if, I, if I'm doing it as this insurance plan because I I can't I'm afraid he's gonna run off or I, I don't have control. I you know, eighteen weeks I look at it and I go my I emphasize like eight to twelve weeks really building in this idea of like you said, recall, building in a really solid recall before they get so bold that they want to venture out and not I feel like there's this window where they always want to be with me when they're little. A lot of times they're just not confident enough to get away. Independent streak at 12 totally. to 16 weeks is usually what yep. we see. Well, it depends on the breed. So you primarily work with labs, right? Yep. Yeah, and we primarily work with short ears, which are a breed. As much as we produce them to be family-oriented hunting dogs, they're designed to be more independent. Sure. They are bred to be more independent. And, and so when we get into those high distracting situations like 
you have to go to the bathroom on the side of the road at a gas station when you're traveling or in a um, pull-off area like a rest stop. There's so much going on. There might be other dogs there. There's other kids, other people, other activities, and a lot of traffic. I need that insurance policy of that lead or that check cord to make sure that they're not going to get in a dangerous situation. Right. Um, so that's how I utilize it. But that's the only time. Yeah. A, we, I, I would use a retractable lead so the dog has enough space to move around to go potty. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and so if I'm taking them for a walk to start to learn how to hunt and whatever. I, at that point, in those situations, there's little under, other than them have another mule. Why? Um, other than it's going them, good over there, guys. All right. <laughs> running into like a rabbit or a squirrel or you know, a little bird to chase, um, but they're still only a 18 week old puppy that chase isn't going to be real strong and real hard and you're going to be able to get their focus back on you um, if you've done that really conditioned recall in those low distracted situations right i think it all comes down to prior to that 18 weeks how much work have you done and i think like it sounds like they do it every day so i would you know you've had a lot of opportunity to develop a range a little early range with that dog and a little recall and you know to me i i have a lot of success with a dog that age, of just turning and leaving them, going the other way. They don't like to necessarily yes. be left. So I don't need to necessarily reel them in. I prefer to reel them in with their idea of where is he going? I want to go over by him. And the second they do, I'll turn around and tell them how good they are and really kind of welcome them to me. I think exactly. that's the habit that I can get formed by doing that. So I just, I hate retractable leads because I feel like it gives the dog so much freedom to do whatever it wants, go whatever it wants. And I just, to me, it's you're on lead, you're in heel position. If you're not, then you're off. It's you're a not. double-edged sword, I would say, because it gives them the freedom to do what they want, like you're saying, and just kind of do what they want to do on lead. But it also is restrictive in a sense that they can't build, like in that walk situation that the person was asking about, that they can't build enough independence and totally. confidence to go out on their own. Yeah, and I, I mean when I, when I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm talking about with the adjustable is like on a walk, walking the dog in the city or whatever. I hate seeing those. Um, it just, it's confusing. It's not fair to the dog. Sometimes the dog can go out, and sometimes it can't. Come on, be, you've got to be black and white. There can't be this gray area. On the walk, like out in the woods like that, yeah, I think you got to let them off and 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 let them develop that confidence. So totally agree. Yes. Okay. Well, that was a good. Way that I describe a lot of things. So, yeah. I, I like about training you, in black and white a lot. I like that you said that. You got to make it easy for them. Like, we shouldn't make it. Should, I don't think this is trying to trick a dog. We need to make it as easy as possible as far as them to understand. I just think they want to make us happy. Make it easy for them to do it. Agreed. Okay. You guys got more questions coming up here. Go, yeah, I had a question I found on right here. Okay, this was a good question that we actually get a lot. I don't know if you get this often, but it's from Chris King on Facebook. It says, any suggestions or things to watch out for when training, raising two dogs? We have a brother-sister GSP pair, three months old. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about raising litter mates together. Got to train them. Yeah. We can talk about it. I, I think you have to separate the, you have to separate them and master something by itself, and then eventually, when it's perfect by themselves, we're going to slowly start to add some distractions. And I won't just all of a sudden put it with another pup. I'd be putting really slowly adding layers to it so that we can build up to the idea of working with another dog. I won't start with the other pup. I'd work with another. Like I do it with um, some of my older really, really self-sufficient, easy dogs that I don't have to think much about, they'll come with us and I'll keep them at a distance, I'll put them on a remote sit and I can work a dog so that it's focusing on me but there is another dog around, and then, but an under control dog around. And then I'll slowly work to the point where we can get them closer and closer. The two litter mates, I think training litter, I've done it a, a lot um, out, of, out of necessity and it's hard because it's very compartmentalized. You have to separate them. Because I just think they have to know it. They have to learn it themselves first. And so... And you do this for a living. Right, I mean, right. You have all the time in the world to devote to litter mates, and it's still hard for you. Yep, yeah. And I feel the same way. Ethan and I feel the same way. Um, we tell people, we first of all, we won't sell litter mates to people. 
um, from our copy letters because having a litter mate sets somebody up for failure in our minds because they don't have the time to devote to mastering things with the individual dogs. Barky? <laughs> They have um, the limited amount of time that people have after work, and they don't want to neglect one of the puppies. They want them both to get the time out. They want them both to get the time and attention. And then you're not giving that individualized attention to each dog to allow training to actually happen. Or the other fail-safe that people use is, oh, well, I'm just going to let them play together and entertain themselves. And that's the worst thing that you can do because they're going to become more bonded to each other. They're not going to care about what you have to say or do, and they're going to establish their own pecking order. One of them is going to become more dominant, and the other is going to become more submissive, and then you're going to have even more behavioral issues down the road. And this person was mentioning that they have brother-sister combos, um, so you also are going to have to watch like heat cycles and things like that because you definitely don't want brother breeding sister and that can happen younger than you expect and think. Yeah, it's cultural impacts again. It's, it goes back to the idea of what it, what the life, it's, what its environment is that it's raised in and you just can't, you can't allow it to be a free-for-all wrestling match. I just can't do it. I always tell people, you can train two dogs, you can train litter mates, you've got to be really ambitious. I mean, it's it's a it's a ton of work. It's a full time job. I mean, and most people aren't able to devote that amount of time to it. Even us, if we are like, I want to develop two puppies at the same time or litter mates. It is horrible Hard. because not only, especially because if we're looking at developing two dogs at the same time, it's typically because we're looking at adding a dog to our string of dogs, um, and you always make comparisons. It's human nature, and then I start comparing, well, this dog learned this faster, this dog was better at this, and then I'm like, well, which one should I keep? Come on. <laughs> he needs Stop another drink. Boy, he's good. These are getting better as we go, too. I think that's how it always works. Um, so if you, yeah, already have, if you already have litter mates, though, um, you just have to put that time in, like Jeremy was saying, of separating them, giving individualized training sessions, individualized time, um, and not letting them have that free-for-all in the backyard and unstructured play all the time. I agree. All right, we're at an hour and a half. I think we should do one more question. Okay. What do you think? One more question sounds perfect. Let's do it. Let's do it because I got it. And you guys got a little one too. Uh, my little one's going to be starting to slow down here. So um, let's do, you, I'll let you, why don't you guys do one, I'll let you guys grab the last question off of one of your, or do you have something that's hot? No. I'm bad at this, unless you've got one already picked up. You got one hot here, big guy? Want, unless you want to do that. Other one. Uh, let me grab that one. I got one for you, Kat. I'm going to send it to you here. Okay, last one, and then, man, first off, thank you. I'll thank you after this, too, but this was, uh, I really enjoyed it. Ben, let's see if Wonder Boy can get me lined up here. So, he earned the, he's earned the nickname Wonder Boy. Let's see. Okay. He says, uh, it's right down your alley. I have a two-year-old German short hair pointer. His name is Memphis. He's really smart, super hyper when I take him hunting. I use him to track deer. He does a nice job. It's just he doesn't follow commands according to what I want. I was wondering if you could train him or give me some tips. Now, I'm not going to train him, but uh, so we'll give him some tips. I think that, so I'm going to simplify his question to try to make it so that we're all talking the same language. And I think it's something that people run into a lot. And so he's really smart, but he's super hyper. How do, how do you, I'm going to, I've got totally an answer in my head, but I want you to answer this one. It's a dog that gets overexcited, it sounds like, and is of the hyper um, classification. What are your thoughts on it? He's smart, but hyper. Okay. That usually honestly goes hand in hand. Those dogs that are um, above average intelligence are typically the dogs that are a little bit more of a handful, uh, whether that's energy related or just they're getting into things because they're smart enough to figure it out. Uh, and those dogs that have that level of intelligence they need a job, and I typically ask people what their day-to-day -day routine is with a dog like that first, um, and usually the answer ends up coming down to the dog's not getting enough 
exercise mentally and physically. Um, those super smart dogs, they need to be constantly challenged mentally. And those type of challenges can be um, going for structured healing walks. They can be extended amounts of time that they have to stay on a dog bed and think about that. We use treadmill work a lot. I don't know if you've ever used a treadmill with your dogs nope. um, where they actually, um, we love them for the dogs in the kennel, uh, for our personal dogs sometimes as well because they have to constantly think about staying at the pace that the treadmill is running. Um, and we don't sprint them. I'm not talking about like we're wearing these out, these dogs out by sprinting them. Um, no, they're usually at a light jog. Uh, and we do interval type training where the incline changes, the seat changes, um, and it's like hip training. And the dogs really have to concentrate and think. So it's very physically and mentally stimulating at the same time. Um, but usually those dogs that have that high level of intelligence and drive and desire need a lot of stimulation and they're not getting enough. Uh, these are working breeds, these are sporting breeds. They're not just pets. It sounds like he hunts him um, and works with him, but my guess would probably be it's not enough. Um, I mean, our dogs get worked a lot, um, whether they're roading, training, hunting during hunting season, or just having those expectations of well-behaved manners in the house and having to concentrate on that would be mentally taxing on a dog. I agree. I love the idea of, and I've watched you guys do some of the treadmill stuff, and I like the idea of it. I, I like the idea of it because of the mental stimulation. I think it's the most overlooked part of wearing out. Everyone wants to wear out and tire out their dogs. And I think all we do, a lot of people just condition them to be better athletes by trying to wear them out. If you run... And just like any marathon runner, totally. the more you work, the more you need. Right. And so I think it's a balance. I think it's a 50-50 balance. I'll go so far as saying that's where I like the idea of the, the treadmill because it is something that is going to require them to think. I think with one of the, one of the parts of his question was is he's super hyper when he takes some hunting. I would guess, and this is a, 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 an assumption, assumption, but I think a lot of people that deal with hyper dogs aren't necessarily as hyper as they, as they believe that they are. They create them and they pour gas on fires to try to put them out. And I think it comes back to, and I'm, I'm, now I'm sounding like a bit of a bro broken record with this cultural impact thing, but I just, I really believe so heavily in the idea of we we build the life for that puppy when it starts all the way through its life. And I think we live in a really fast society. I go, 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 go. I'm really worried about being efficient with everything I do. I want to get a ton of stuff done in a really small period of time. I think it's human nature. I think it's just a very, it's a, it's a cultural thing. And it's, it's real American, quite honestly. But, I, and I'm as patriotic as you're gonna find. Like I bleed red, white, and blue. I love our country. But I think sometimes we go so fast and we're so driven by results that we condition in with little young dogs from the start, the very first session, the very first lesson, all the way through, I run into, I ran into it to, today or yesterday with Bella, where I said, we're, going, we're getting a lot done and things are going really well. And I find myself ramping up the speed of the lesson, the session. We're, let's go do this, let's go do this, let's go do this. And all of a sudden, Bella starts to go up, 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 to the point where she's nearly boiling. She's about to boil over. And, and when she boils over, I lose control. And then all of a sudden, what do I do? No, 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 no. I get down on her to bring her back down. What I need to do a better job of is reading the level of as she ramps up and go, slow the hell down for a second and let her come back down and balance out. And so I am I think, in general, I need to do that. Like, I'm, I'm getting intense with this conversation right now. And I can literally feel myself raising up. And so I need to slow down and take a little bit more time and think about what I'm going to say. And all of a sudden, this whole room kind of goes like this. And I just think that we create so much pace. We have to go so fast with everything that we're doing in life. The dog training for me is my time to say, forget about the rest of the stuff and slow down. And when I do that, that's real impactful on that dog. And so this guy that's got this dog that he goes out and he takes hunting, I think they carry that energy with them because that's just the way they do things when they're with dad. And so they're looking to get this big 
relief of go, just let it go. And I go, slow down. And let, don't let the pressure build up so much that it, boom, explodes and we don't have that control. And I just think, I, I, love, dog, I love dogs. I love working with the dogs because it impacts the rest of my life. I'm the same way with my kids. I'm the same way with my wife. I'm the same way with Ben. Ben is like my little, he's, a, he's half my boy and he's half my buddy, you know? Like, I, he is real, Wonder Boy is wonderful. But I look at that and I go, when I'm pissed at work, take a deep breath, slow down, think about it. And it's the exact same thing when I'm out in the field with the dog. If something doesn't go well and I'm upset about it, take a deep breath, slow down. And just all of a sudden things go so much better all the time. And I don't, I'm not saying move at a snail's pace. Well, that's, that's important to point out that, that what you just said right there. When you're upset, training, right? You're a professional, you've done this, you know how it works, you know everything. And there's still times that you're gonna go, you know, damn it, whatever, you know, you need to... Take a step back. You need to be able to take a step back. And because you're not gonna make any progress when you're feeling that way. Right. It's recognizing it. And so it's recognizing and understanding it. And being honest with yourself. Totally. But it's a natural response. Absolutely. So when people are at home training their dogs and they get frustrated, us as professionals that do this all the time, it's not that we don't get frustrated. It's just that we have a better, uh, you know, better handle on how to it. recognize and understand and how to handle it. I try to. I don't know if I am that much, but I try to. But try. Right. Yes. But, it, but but I just think it's a natural response. Totally. And I think that idea of this guy who's got this dog that, you know, he's he's really smart, but he's too hyper. I look at it and I go, I don't know what the guy's name was, but I say, whoever it was, slow down all the time. And have and I think that two people make excuses for their dog sometimes. Well, they're just a puppy, they're just hyper, they have to do this, and then I can get them back under control. And we're setting those dogs up for that. We're, we're self-fulfilling that prophecy of, well, my dog's hyper and they're wild and they hit the field and they have to make a 250-yard cast and blow off some steam, and then they can come back and get under control. Or I run them for five or 10 minutes before I get to the field I'm gonna hunt. I just dump them out of the truck and run them down the ditch. I hear that a lot, too. Totally. It's the absolute opposite of what I'm, it, you're building in and we're just that problem. Conditioning that, response. that goes exactly to what you said earlier. Yeah. yeah, everything that you're doing with your dog, you're conditioning them to. So every time you hit the field, your dog's conditioned that they need to make this huge push to blow off right. some steam before they can settle in and hunt. Or they have to run a quarter of a mile or four miles or whatever you can set down the gravel road right. before they can start hunting. Right. And they're just, that's the expectation and you've made that excuse for them instead of taking a little bit of time, slowing down, like Jeremy said, and saying, I'm gonna handle this situation, keep my dog under control, keep them in range, calm expectations are gonna make that dog calmer and handle the situation. It's better. Absolutely. Yeah, I wear, I can wear a dog out better going less than 100 yards and taking 20 minutes to do it than I would running a dog for 20 minutes. My dog will be tired, more tired walking 100 yards in 20 minutes because I might turn and then turn and then turn, but I don't cover very much ground. It, but it's back to that idea what you were talking about, challenging them mentally to stay with me. And the little bit of physical burn is more than enough. But I think they tire. I get tired after a long day. There's a lot of people that get really tired when they go home and they don't do 3,000 steps in a day. But they've been sitting thinking in front of a computer and they're looking at a monitor and they're working their mind so much they're exhausted when they get home. We need to find that balance. For and that person needs to find the balance too. Yeah. When you go to, a, when you go to a, an event, you're at a show all day. You mean you spend. I don't know, six, eight hours, whatever, talking to people. I'm mentally right. exhausted at the end of that. Right. It's like, you want to go out, have a drink, eat dinner? No, nope. Nope, I'm, I'm exhausted. Ready to to I'm right. ready to go to bed. Totally. Yeah. Okay. This is the longest dog bone podcast ever. Uh, <laughs> love it. Love it. That's good. We got at least 18 minutes left, right? No, we're cutting it down. We're, gonna, we're cutting it. We're, we're at an hour 42. We're at hour 42. Are you guys good with calling it an evening? Yes, oh, yeah, we are. Yeah.
Okay. Uh, but we need to plan, and so this is on here. We need to. It's going to be planned. It's going to be posted on social. We will have the e-collar, no e-collar debate. Yes, I think that would be a really good one because we're both open-minded enough and respect each other's opinions and training abilities enough that it would be a good conversation. I agree. I agree. I love and then it. You had something else. Hold conditioning versus force. Hold conditioning versus force fetch. There you go. That would be another good one. That would be another really good one to spend I, some time on. I just saw somebody asked about it on yours as well. So that that's the second time someone's asked it. So um, oh, there it is right there, yeah. So I think uh, I'm all for it, man. I think we need to do it again. I, I wanna th first off I wanna thank you guys for doing this. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. I really appreciate the people who watched this, who helped us with questions. Um, I enjoyed it. I think, I think, again, right now is a time that the more that any of us, and I don't care if it's Ethan and Kat or me and Ben or whoever is watching it, any chance you have right now to help somebody that needs help, I think you should do it. I think you should do it no matter what, but I think like right now is a really, really important time for us to do it. And so the idea with this was, there's a lot of people at home right now looking to do some training. What can we do to help? I hope we helped some of you tonight with some of your questions. I think we can build off of this. Because I, th I thought it was kind of fun too. I love having Ben mix drinks. I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. But you do. Uh, everybody needs a Ben. That's, that's for sure. So thank you, you guys, for doing this. Uh, thank you, everybody who was watching it. We're I'm actually we're on yours. I'll let you guys thank you, your followers there too. But oh, yeah. I appreciate I know, it. I switched it up. Well, thank you very much for inviting us to do something like this. This was awesome. Virtual happy hour. Answer some questions. Have some cocktails. We love uh, talking to people and sharing our knowledge. And we're happy to do this again sometime. Totally. I think we will. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you all for watching. We're going to call it a night. Yes. Take care, you guys. Be safe, be healthy, and stay positive.